to start with a big question, which is what really are social movements? And I would say that at their core, social movements are really about contestation and power. They tend to be large, uh, often rather informal groupings of people who come together around a common cause, uh, very often in response to what they perceive to be situations of inequality, oppression, unmet social, political, or cultural needs, um, and such demands. They are really intended to transform existing power structures and dynamics through contestation and opposition. I think it's really important to keep in mind that social movements are not a new phenomenon by any uh, stretch or means, uh, but actually have deep historical roots. You can go to any kind of setting, really, and see how people come together uh, to demand change from the bottom up. So, for example, uh, if you look at what has been happening across uh, established democracies in the United States and the UK, you have these Occupy movements, you have uh, the Black Lives Lives Matter movements um, and and the like. Um, you can also look at the kind of the kinds of uh, widespread protests that more upper income and established democracies or recently um, democratized upper middle countries have experienced in places like Brazil, India, and Turkey. Um, and you can also see what is happening um, in terms of transformational politics from from below in countries that are in the midst of very powerful uh, and fraught uh, processes of transformation. Um, obviously, uh, uh, the Middle East is an example of this, MENA, the MENA region, uh, but also you can see, for example, what is happening in Venezuela in Latin America. However, I think it's also really important to emphasize uh, that social movements are not always progressive. Um, this means that they don't always have um, agendas that we would consider um, as pro-empowerment um, of poor people, let's say. Uh, so if you think about religious fundamentalism or neo-Nazism or ethnic nationalism, these have often uh, had roots in and be spread by social movements, uh, um, also historically. So this is an important caveat to keep in mind. Even when social movements don't succeed, um, they can set in motion very profound uh, transformations along very many dim dimensions, be it political, social, economic, cultural, or what have you. And change can happen both domestically inside a country um, as well as um, in the international arena. Not every grievance will give rise to a social movement, so not, not every perceived injustice ends up uh, transforming itself into a social movement. So really, there is a question uh, to be asked about when it is that social movements do emerge and how it is that they are sustained over time. Um, and this is a question that has occupied quite a bit of attention um, in the social sciences for some time. Um, and I would say that more, more recent scholarship tends to emphasize that effective mo mobilization uh, does not tend to be predictable or linear, but rather social movements tend to be contingent, uh, growing or shrinking in response to contextual factors uh, that enable or restrain them. So, for example, um, if there is a political or, eco or eco economic crisis, this can open up um, opportunities for contention and, contention and contestation that would otherwise um, uh, remain closed. Rapid scientific changes can also open up or close down spaces, increased urbanization and the growth of, of uh, a, a more active citizenship um, can also be important in, in broadening this, the scope and possibility for action. Do you also need to have um, some way of, of bringing people together in, in a manner that resonates across uh, different people who then agree to come together um, collectively for a common purpose. So this is where uh, one thinks about the importance of uh, building solidarities and networks of, of community and bonds um, across different groups, uh, the need to, to develop and um, harness sh shared meanings and understandings and common purposes uh, within particular groups that can also transcend uh, partic uh, particular groups to actually be able to bring broader coalitions for change forward. And the key here is to somehow uh, maintain the ability and the possibility to enable uh, people to feel connected even across uh, different identities and boundaries. Also a very important role, uh, role for leaders and activists um, in harnessing social movements and in giving them continuity over time. Um, 
But usually uh, social movements are less hierarchical and the idea here of leadership is perhaps uh, more fluid. So it may not be a singular figure, but certainly a feeling that there are people or ideas that, that are being looked up to, uh, to, to harness collective action. If you think about um, movements to promote human rights, uh, gender equality, and action on climate change, for example, um, there's also a very important element of social activism that can, transcend, that can transcend domestic boundaries and link up to struggles that, that, that um, are not just internal, but really international, regional, um, uh, and more global, if you will. Um, and so these transnational networks of solid solidarity have been really important in, in harnessing collective action and also changing a lot of the values and norms that we, that we embrace at the global level. I also think it's, it's, it's sort of interesting to discuss the role of social movements um, within what are broader processes of, uh, of collective action or really broader um, channels for people to exercise voice and representation. And what you see uh, happening over the past two or three decades, I would say, since the heyday of the, the, the great optimism that, that we experienced with, with uh, the wave of democratization from the 1990s onward. When that optimism started to fade away, starting with a new millennium, um, you, you can see how traditional forms um, of more traditional uh, formal mechanisms to, to articulate voice and collective action, including most prominently parties and, and parliaments, have really experienced uh, a deepening crisis um, in, in their ability to harness um, collective action and representation. And in fact, um, surveys from all over the world, not just the developing world, but also across the developed world, show that in people's eyes, the, the institutions that consistently rank lowest in terms of the trust that people have in them happen to be political parties and uh, parliaments. So this kind of disillusionment uh, with formal mechanisms of democratic representation really have contributed to contributed to the growth of social movements um, more recently. Um, as citizens and, and uh, populations in general try to find different means to exercise voice um, that perhaps uh, feel more effective or more genuine. Um, but we still don't know enough about how social movements may channel voice um, in ways that may be more meaningful and effective uh, than these more traditional channels. So for example, there's a key question here, can informal social movements really substitute political parties um, over time? Um, is this an either, either or proposition? And if, if social movements can in, ha in fact supplant political parties, how would they do that? Um, there are some actually interesting examples of where social movements have themselves transformed into highly functional and effective political parties. Think, for example, um, before all these scandals rocked, uh, rocked Brazil, of the Workers' Party there and how effective it was at at really channeling a vision of transformation uh, from being a uh, very effective movement to then uh, being a very effective party in power and, and what that did in terms of transforming the political landscape in, in um, Brazil. But despite this, it's actually curious that the linkages between social movements and political parties and the potential that this has in terms of impacting policy and broader political outcomes remains largely unexplored. So this is a, a big research gap, I would say, uh, really understanding these articulations between social movements and parties better and, and what happens in terms of policy. Now we have the internet, we have computers, we have mobile technology, we have every sort of way of connecting people in ways uh, that work utterly unimaginable just a few decades ago um, across time and space and you know without any regard for physical interaction in that sense. Uh, but I think it's also very important to keep in mind that ICTs are really only tools of mobilization and they themselves cannot bring about transformational change. For the most part, uh, while donors have been extremely active in the field of civil society support, mostly through uh, supporting, for example, non-governmental organizations and the media, um, they have really 
try to stay um, away from actively and directly engaging with social movements. And there are um, a number of very good reasons for that that are explored in, in some of the reading that we have highlighted for this reading pack. But you know, if you just think about what I have been talking about here, the nature of um, social movements and how they come to be in the first place, there's a lot of unpredictability about how they come about. So this makes it very hard to plan, and it is not clear you know, when social movements will emerge and fizzle out. And so for donors, this tends to be an area of high uncertainty. So therefore, um, it is better to stay away. Uh, obviously, as I was saying earlier, social movements, by their very nature, are deeply political. There's also concerns, for example, that if a donor is, is perceived or seen as supporting a social movement, uh, governments in developing countries where the social movement is active and instigating trouble may find that this is actually dabbling uh, in very um, unwelcome ways in local politics and taking sides um, and, and uh, siding with the opposition. If social movements are informal by their very nature, it also it doesn't fit quite well with how donors work in terms of their requirements and their um, bureaucratic proce procedures. So it can be very difficult to actually um, work with social movements based on the on the kinds of bureaucratic procedures that have to be followed. There is this issue that many social movements uh, will prefer not to engage directly with donors and take money from the outside for fear of compromising their own autonomy um, and their, you know, their, their very being. So there's this issue of if they accept money from, from the outside, they're compromising themselves um, automatically. So this is a, a problem. Um, and there's also the, the, the issue that keeps coming up again and again in development efforts, which is really when when the whole issue is about empowering people, people from the bottom up, this is inherently a long-term process um, that doesn't really have a beginning and an end, um, and, and really takes a lot of time and does not necessarily uh, generate results um, quickly or in a way that donors recognize it uh, within a short time frame. And so really the, the key message is that there is a need to be uh, much more patient and to remain engaged over the long term.